University, where he received his MS and PhD degree. He worked at Argonne National Laboratories before coming to UCSD, and he's a professor of physics there, here, I should say. Um, okay, he has lots and lots of honors, and uh, which too many uh, to say. I'll just mention one, the Humboldt Award, which I'm very familiar with. Uh, his scientific interests include the preparation, characterization, and study of metallic super lattices, heterostructures, and nanostructures. And I think I'm not going to bother reading all that to you. But in any event, uh, he has a huge number of publications, and he also is one of the most cited researchers, uh, both in physics and also in a much wider field. So um, to keep Brief, I will welcome Professor Schiller. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for, com uh, for coming. And, uh, and uh, what, uh, what I want to say, since the audience is not extraordinarily big, uh, please feel free to ask questions at any time. I'll be happy to answer them and I'll finish on time. I'm very good at this, finishing on time. So you don't have to worry that you have to sit here for the next uh, Four hours, it's only three hours. <laughs> okay, uh, so the work that I will tell you about is in collaboration with several people that uh, from the University of California and people from Motorola. The one person that is still here is Igor Roshin, and much of the work that I'll tell you about it was done by him. Johan Ackerman was here and now he's at Motorola. Chris Layton is at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Sihon Kim uh, went to, to work for a company in Minneapolis, and I'm not sure what happened to him after that. And uh, Aldo Romero is in Mexico now. Uh, I, I, Roberto Escudero spent a sabbatical here on, in my lab, and David Rapson used to be at the University of California, San Diego, and then he went to Florida, and then uh, he continued working on this. He still, I think, continues working on similar problems. Javier Batre is here in sabbatical now, so you can, uh, so this work started way before. Oh, the hell did I do? I give myself the time, the talk is over, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tag myself so I know that I'm on. So I should have. Okay, well, I could recover another 10 minutes for, for myself. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, from Motorola, uh, there was a bunch of people that, that worked on this problem. Uh, Sayed Tehran is the man who's in charge of their, of their MRAM program and uh, is the man that will probably get the MRAM program going. Okay, so of course, uh, we have to acknowledge the people that give us the money, the Department of Energy, who's been supporting me for pretty much all my scientific work, and DARPA. Okay, so everybody knows about this already, but I just thought that for those of you, for those few of you that don't know about this, let me just remind you about this business, this word that was invented uh, by uh, Stuart Wolf a few years ago, Spintronics, is electronic devices with the direction uh, and electronic, uh, of an electrospin, uh, is it, it, just as important as its charge. Okay, so this is, and basically all this business relies on the fact that if you have a normal material, then the, the two spin states have the same, uh, uh, they have a balanced fermi surface, and, and on the other hand, if you have a ferromagnetic material, there is an imbalance, and so there are some spins, say these down spins, there are more at the fermi surface than there is up spins. And because of that, there is this phenomenon of spin bottleneck, which gives rise to magnetoresistance. This was actually, what I will tell you about is, uh, and I hope that uh, I will convey you this, and I'm, of course, the right audience is not, not always there, I'm preaching to the choir, but there is two things that I want to leave here. It's one thing, and there's a few people of, that this would be a good lesson, a few. And one thing is that basic research is very important and gives rise to applications that are totally unpredictable. And the, the research that I will tell you about is, is research that came out from basic research it is not targeted research, it is not research that was aimed towards in a particular direction. That's number one. And number two, that, that I, what I wanted to point out to you also is that another second sort of a role that we university professors anyhow have is to have people like, uh, like uh, for instance, Johan Ackerman, who now is at Motorola actually doing applied work. So that's the second sort of a, a thing that I wanted to, uh, to leave you. So in both, uh, if you are interested in applications or are interested in basic research, basic research is important and it pays. At the end, it does produce money, and so that's what I want to tell you. But however, it cannot be targeted. Uh, if you, everything else uh, is irrelevant. If you want to 
to fall asleep at this stage of the game, it's okay with me. So let me tell you, let me show you what, what I'm talking about, what kind of uh, important devices I'm talking about. Unless you're a very weird person, you have the devices that I will tell you about here in your own home. It's the read head. Every read head nowadays works on the principles in which I will tell you today, in which I will discuss the physics of them today. And in fact, pretty soon, within probably uh, a year, hopefully, the magnetic random access memories which have been developed at Motorola will be your telephones. Uh, they are very confident, and uh, actually Casey Miller was there a week ago, actually, uh, uh, and he tells me that they are even more confident now, right, Casey? Yeah. They are very confident that this will be your telephones nowadays. Mm. Now, in terms of that, these kind of devices rely, basically, they are made out of a device that looks like this. It's a four-layer device. There is a, an antiferromagnet, this is in principle, actually in practice, has more than four layers. But. There is an antiferromagnet which has its spins uh, alternating as you're going along, say, this direction here. Then that antiferromagnet provides a pinning for a ferromagnetic layer there, which has, let's say, say the spins pointing to the right here. And then there is a spacer of some sort. And then there is what is called a free ferromagnet, which can rotate. And this is the basis for this device. The basis for this device is that, basically, there is two phenomena that are occurring here. One phenomenon that occurs is this exchange bias phenomenon, which is the phenomenon which occurs is the way that this antiferromagnet pins the ferromagnet. I won't tell you about that. This is actually called a spin valve. I, what I will tell you today is about these three layers here. The phenomenon that occurs in these three layers, which is basically the current that flows from this layer to that layer. And, and basically the way this device works is that if the, the, the two layers have the spins pointing in the same direction, the resistance is... Uh, is low, and if the uh, two layers point in opposite direction, the resistance is high. That's, that's the bottom line, the way this system operates. And so there is two interesting uh, phenomena here, magnetic tunneling and exchange bias. And what I will fo focus on is on this magnetic tunneling. Okay, so here's the concept. The concept is uh, you have a barrier, quantum mechanical barrier. There is an electrode <coughs> on this side. There is another electrode on that side. And because of this weird thing of quantum mechanics, an electrode that comes al along here, it is able to tunnel through this barrier. It doesn't go above the tunnel barrier, it is able to go across the barrier. It can tunnel through the barrier. That's what quantum mechanics predicted. And this was already discovered by one of the physicists that got the least amount of, uh, of publicity, well, not publicity, but certainly recognition in some ways, I think, is Oppenheimer, who keeps on appealing in all kinds of uh, situations. And I actually track back this to a paper of, the first time that this was pointed out, this was pointed out by Oppenheimer in 1928, to explain some properties of atoms, okay? Well, you know, you can pro explain the properties of atoms in all kinds of ways, but there is probably many other ways of explaining properties of atoms, okay? So who knows whether this tunneling is really true, and there was a, a Fowler and Northheim claim after that and explain some other properties. And uh, this thing had really clinched when Gever came along in 1960, and he came up with, he was a graduate student, so, you know, he was a really good graduate student, and he published this paper on his own without putting his professor name, so he got the Nobel Prize alone. Okay, so, you know, this really worried me. <laughs> so here it is, but he came up with the following thing. He knew, because he was an engineer actually when he was a graduate student already, he knew that if he takes aluminum, and this is not a ferromagnetic matter, but if you take aluminum, and, and aluminum sort of naturally grows an oxide on it, right? And a very thin oxide, an insulating oxide of about 10 angstroms. So now what we are going to talk about is we are going to take a ferromagnetic material, grow a very thin 10 angstrom, insulator on it and put another ferromagnetic material and see how the tunneling occurs. And notice why am I talking that this 